Welcome in, fam. I'm Tanitra Batiste here with my special guest and friend to the show, Locked On Falcons host Aaron Freeman. Today on ATL Day Ones, we're going to toss up the question, they got a guy, but is it the guy? And is it do or die for the folks in Flowery Branch and in For the Culture? We're going to do a little rapid fire. That is all on deck today. So let's go. This is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hey, everybody, we appreciate you stopping by ATL Day Ones. Of course, it is sponsored by Bet Online and powered by you, our Locked On family. And for this network, you know how we know you guys are family? Because you have gotten Locked On Sports Atlanta over 5,000 subscribers, and we appreciate you for that. Because listen, when we give you the good content, we want you guys to keep coming back and telling other people to come back for that content as well. And Aaron, you know we got a lot to talk about today, a lot of good things popping off in the Atlanta metro area as far as our sports landscape goes. So let's start with Georgia Tech. We finally got some good news and some news from On the Flats. We, of course, were told late Tuesday was confirmed that Brett Key has his interim tag taken off, and he is now officially the head coach for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Now, of course, he went 4-4 and during his eight-game stretch. That, of course, was after uh, Tech parted ways with Jeff Collins. And, you know, it was a very interesting, I'll say 36 hours because we heard, okay, it is Brent Key. No, it's not Brent Key. No, it is Brent Key. No, it's not Brent Key. Turns out it is Brent Key after all. So my question to you is this, do you, in your opinion, do you feel like this was more of a hire that was not so much about Brent Key as it was, hey, Tech just couldn't come to terms with Tulane's head coach, Willie Fritz, or... Was it pressure from the boosters who were actually in favor of Key along with the players? Or do you feel like it was a mix of both in the decision that uh, Jay Bat and Angel Cabrera were able to make? Yeah, it does feel kind of a little bit like a mix of both. You know, Mm -hmm. my my experience with Brent Key is uh, he was, uh, you know, beat my team the the pit panthers and so <laughs> from my perspective yeah he did a pretty good job uh from that perspective but you you do kind of wonder if he was sort of their first choice uh yeah. and so if he wasn't and they couldn't get that first choice uh you know if he's a it seems like a pretty good plan b to sort of take some of that momentum that he seemed to generate uh in the back half of the season for tech uh into next year and, and potentially into the future Yeah, and I think that's a great point because it really is about future building. This is an area, whether you look at Georgia or just the South overall, that really UGA has on lockdown for obvious reasons, right? So Jeff Collins, to his credit, tried his best to kind of put a dent in the recruiting efforts of UGA on behalf of Georgia Tech. And on at some point and at at times he was able to get some four-star players in there, but ultimately it just didn't work out. But I do think there's something a little bit different about Brent Key that could bode well. And maybe that also is a reason that Tech decided, hey, let's go ahead and get this out of the way. We know our regular season is done. So now Brent Key can go back to the war room and start strategizing on how they could possibly do two things, I think, Aaron. Number one, they can get on the recruiting trail and talk about the fact that, hey, he has a legitimate great uh, record of success when you look at the fact that he had four wins, something that in three seasons, Jeff Collins didn't do, never got past three wins. And the other thing is it gives Brent Key the opportunity to maybe retain some of those players that may have been on the fence. Obviously, you saw the video yesterday. Players really, really love him, support him, and rally behind him. But maybe for those who are on the fence, it's an opportunity to say, yeah, we kind of sort of think that uh, we want to hear what Brent Key has to say before we make the decision on whether or not we're going to go into the transfer portal. And speaking of that, you kind of look at this year and you say, okay, kind of ended well for him. He got to 500 something again that the prior his uh, predecessor did not get to. But when you look at the Georgia Tech program overall, what in your opinion would be success? What does success look like maybe in year one, year two? And, and should he get there year three for Brent Key? Yeah, you know, I think 
you know, the bowls don't count as much in today's college sports Mm -hmm. as they used to. But I do think getting Georgia Tech back to a team that you can expect year in and year out to to go to a bowl game each and every year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he can pull that off in year one, but like if you can feel like there's progress getting there where it's like, okay, Georgia Tech is not this also ran in the ACC. Like they're a legit team that you can start to build towards, you know, maybe two years from now, three years mm-hmm. from now, they can legitimately challenge, uh, you know, for a potential ACC title uh, and, and, and going that far and, and suddenly making, you know, there's two legit college f- football teams in the state of Georgia. Yeah, I agree. And I think that is a very legitimate and very reasonable barometer for success, right? Because Clemson, at least what we've seen the last couple of years, they're not quite that Clemson anymore and Florida State's coming up. So there are teams in the ACC that are starting to say, hey, we can build a quality program and at least contend with Clemson for the ACC title. And and if you can contend for that title, then that means you could potentially contend for a spot in the college football playoff. Or like you said, at least get a high end bowl. Maybe you'll get a New Year's six bid or something to that effect. So yeah, I think that that could at a minimum, you almost got into a bowl game somehow this year after the, the horrific start you had. So I think getting to a bowl and contending for that conference title is definitely something that should be a good look. And listen, this wasn't just news here nas- locally. This was news lo- nationally as well. So just like this story, and I'm sure one of the others that we're going to talk about, Aaron and I are going to have reaction to the news that Kyle Pitts had uh, knee injury uh, surgery just today. So he's done. Uh, for the season. So we'll talk a little bit about that and get reaction. But I'm sure our friends over at Lockdown Sports today are doing the same because this is something where we kind of thought that his injury was going to lead to the potential end of the season. But now you know for sure. So when you have big news like that, they give you the reaction, the biggest impact in sports, and they're going to be monitoring things like the return of Deshaun Watson and what that means to the Browns. You want to hear all that national news? Go ahead and check out Locked On Sports today. Of course, after you check out ATL day one, they'll give you all the news you need. And just like we have for the culture on this show, they have theirs that's called Take of the Day. And I am sure that KP and the story around him and losing him for the season officially is going to be something that you could hear on Locked On Sports today. So again, you go to Locked On Falcons. And you download them on the Odyssey app. You check out Locked On Falcons as well as ATL Day Ones on YouTube. And so we want you to do that with our two shows as well as Locked On Sports Today anywhere you download your podcast. Now, we've got some good things going on in the flats, right? And of course, we're looking forward to some potentially good things going on uh, at the bins this weekend for UGA. But things away from and on some level at State Farm Arena have not been so great or the Atlanta Hawks, but they're trying to get back on track today. They're taking on the Magic. They're hoping rather tonight that they'll at least be able to wrap up this uh, road trip at 500, right? But here's the thing that kind of concerns me. Um, When I look at this game, I feel like, okay, they should win, right? No Jalen Suggs, no Little Carter Jr. The only one who's really doubtful for the Hawks would be uh, Jalen Johnson, which don't get me wrong, he's he's been solid off the bench. And Bogdan Bogdanovich has actually been upgraded to, to doubtful, but he, he's not going to play. But that's a good thing. He's progressing. All right, Aaron, don't you feel like this is a gimme? Like, shouldn't this be just a game where we just check a box and keep it moving or or should we? Yeah, that's that's the interesting thing about the Hawks, right? You know, and look, I, I don't profess myself an expert on the Hawks. I get all my takes from Locked On Hawks and Brad Roland. Uh, yes, when it comes I, to I, that. Brad, yes. I, just, I just basically repeat those things uh, and pretend like, I, you know, I know what I'm talking about. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of talk these last couple of days, given some of the Hawks struggles is, you know, with their coaching situation. And it feels like with every loss, especially when you have these sort of unexpected losses, you know, those calls for uh, uh Nate, you know, hashtag fire Nate or, or whatever, right. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, get louder. And so they, they kind of need to sort of take care of business um, against this magic team that you do feel like this should be a win for this Hawks team, given you know, the expectations that the Hawks are and, and should be one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference. Same. I, I feel like this should be a gimme. I hope it's a gimme. And I hope it's kind of a tune up as well for them, Aaron, because they have a really challenging slate that's coming up. Once they get past the magic tonight, 
They come back home Friday. They're taking on the Denver Nuggets. And yeah, they might have a little gimme in, in that they're going to play the Thunder as well. But then you've got some serious contenders in there where they really kind of start to, they're going to have that opportunity, you know, just like they've had a recent with playing the Heat, for example, and of course the Celtics, getting a barometer to say, okay, where exactly are we? Because when you look at that schedule, it starts to get intense for the next six games. Like I said, you've got um, the, the Nuggets on Friday, then they get a little bit of a break. They come back with the Thunder and the Thunder are kind of here and there. I don't want to call them bad. They're not exactly great. And of course, whenever you play the Knicks, whenever the Hawks play the Knicks, regardless of how good or bad the Hawks are and vice versa, that's just like, that's kind of a new school rivalry for them. That's just kind of a, a, a slug fest. And then of course, they're going to stay up top. They're going to play the Nets. They're going to play uh, the Bulls in that time frame as well. And of course, they're going to play the Grizzlies. So definitely they're going to have their test in these next six or so games to see just how good they are. And I feel like for me, Aaron, what I need to see is consistency. What I need to see is the same energy that you see in the first half across all five starters and even the bench mob. Let me see that in the 47th minute, because for Joel Embiid, I don't care how great he is for him to have scored seven points in the last 60 seconds of that game and literally snatched that game away from the Hawks, or maybe they gave it away, depending on who you are. That's what I really want to see, because if you get some of that from each of their starters and you get that on a consistent basis and just a little bit more from your bench that like you've been getting, get, getting a little bit more maybe from an A.J. Griffin, for example, uh, who's been having great games, except maybe just a little bit of an off game Monday. I think that they should be just fine. But for me, Aaron, it's all about can we just see consistency and can we see a clean game down the stretch? Because DeJounte Murray having seven turnovers and although Trey had three turnovers only, the third one was the dagger. Got to be a you can't not even with a team like the magic have 19 turnovers and expect to win a game. Absolutely. Yeah. And you wonder if they can get that sort of clean performance. As you say, they have some tough tests ahead of them. They also have some games uh, as we're talking about, like the magic tonight and, and later on that you expect this team to win. You know, you do have, uh, you know, potential tune up game. We, we know Trey is, is great in the garden. So uh, <laughs> yes. I feel like if we could, if, if, if the Hawks can sort of, you know, get some wins against some of these uh, tougher opponents. And then, you know, Trey does his thing uh, in New York. It, it does feel like this season can start to really get back on track uh, for this football team, but uh, I'm sorry for this basketball team. I'm so used to talking uh, about football, but yeah, I, I do feel like they have to play a little bit more consistently. They have to play a little bit more clean. Um, and, you know, if they can do that, I think they should be able to take care of business against the magic and see if they can mm -hmm. start getting some momentum uh, in these coming weeks. Indeed, indeed. And you talk about a test and we're going to talk a little bit more about it and deep dive in a moment. But a test is indeed coming up for the Falcons. They take on the Steelers and they're both kind of those teams where they show shades of, of brilliance or shades of greatness or shades of strong goodness. And then they kind of fall back to the median. So we're going to see what happens this coming week. But if you want to know what the odds makers are thinking about that game, go to betonline.net. That's your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Even we as uh, sports journalists and, and, and talk show hosts, if you will, we kind of check it out to kind of see what the trends are as well. And that's not just in the NFL, by the way, that's in the NBA and of course, Major League Baseball when it's in season, but also for some of the niche sports like MMA, golf, tennis, you can go and get all of that information right there. Even college football, you know, there's a big game coming up, the SEC championship game on Saturday. Get your information there. Now, as far as that Falcon Steelers game, as of now, Aaron, the Falcons are one point favorites over the Steelers, according to betonline.net. And the over under is around 42. We'll see if that stays. But again, you guys, if you want to know, go ahead and monitor it there. They've got podcasts just like this one where you can get all your information. So again, it's real simple betonline.net because that is where the game starts now. That's where the game starts for those who want to bet on Falcon Steelers. But unfortunately, the game, at least for one guy, has ended for this season, and that is Kyle Pitts. Of course, Aaron, we just got the news that it's official. Uh, Kyle Pitts had season-ending surgery, and so, of course, we knew we were expecting him to be gone for at least four weeks, probably wouldn't get him back until 15, 16, you know, 17, one of the last games of the season, if you got him back. But now we know we're not getting him back for good. So my question to you is this. We know that the two bigs who went down at the same time were Kyle Pitts and Taquan Graham. Uh, TQ, obviously, we, the Falcons missed him greatly on Sunday. But 
you saw what the Falcons were able to do on Sunday on offense to some degree uh, in the passing game. But what do you feel like is the biggest loss now that you know for sure you're not going to see eight on the field again this season? Well, I think you can make a, a pretty good case for TQ being the bigger loss, mm-hmm. given what Washington was able to do on the ground against them. Um, and, you know, it wasn't as if they were like a stellar run defense with TQ on the field, but it did feel right. like they were good enough, right. uh, you know, earlier in the season to sort of get the job done there. Mm-hmm. Um, and but, you know, I, I still look at Kyle Pitts as a, a difference maker, even if he's not doing it on the stat sheet. Yes. Um, and, yes. it, you know, it does feel like it's not a coincidence that the Falcons offense really struggled to put points on the board without Kyle Pitts, mm-hmm. even though that we know that the strength of their offense is their running game. So I still feel like having pits makes this offense better. And, and we know that the, you know, the, the thing that's kind of driving the bus for the Falcons is their offense. It's the running game. And, you know, what's interesting to me was someone was asking me th- this on Twitter about like, mm-hmm. you know, that they should be able to run this week against the Steelers. And it's like, well, they've been able to run pretty much every week yeah. uh, against wh- whoever they do. But like the thing that kind of makes the difference between their ability to win games and lose games is if one of these other aspects of their offense shows up and that's yeah. either the passing game, that's either the defense making plays, getting stops, getting turnovers or, you know, doing what CP did a couple of weeks ago or earlier in the season with that block punt, you know, mm-hmm. special teams making a play. So yeah. part of me kind of wonders, you know, that's where you kind of need a Kyle Pitts. That's where you kind of need to take on Graham. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, basically, you asked me what's the bigger loss. I I, I kind of come down on both sides of it. I don't really have a definitive answer for you. Yeah, no, I I could make the case, and I, I see how you could make the case there as well because, like you said, the run game it stands for itself, and you have to give a, a lot of credit to even the running core by committee when uh, Cordero Patterson was out a couple of weeks. So that tells you that that's truly a strength that the Falcons can rely on every week. But you kind of called something out just a minute ago, and I agree with you. I think it's always what's going to be the X factor week to week that's the complement to the run game in order for the Falcons to get the win or at least put themselves in position to win. And like you said, each week it's maybe been a, a different, uh, maybe been a different, the difference maker might be maybe not Kyle Pitts on the stat line, but maybe there's a key block that he gave, or maybe there's just the ability to say, hey, don't think he's just that uh, Marcus Mariota is automatically just going to go to Drake London, or it seems like even, you know, an OZ or a Demir Bird have been uh, favored targets of his. But when you have Kyle Pitts out there, it just at least keeps the defense honest. And then, of course, we've seen a couple different times where one member of the defense has literally sealed the game in the end. And then you talked about special teams as well. So yeah, that's kind of where you, when you lean to Kyle Pitts, you say, wow, that's kind of an X factor. One more X factor that uh, Arthur Smith doesn't have to work with in, in the toolbox. And then it kind of takes you to this Sunday as well. Like, okay, fine. You know, you're not getting KP back. You're probably not going to get TQ back. So now Going into this final game before the bye, what's that looking like? Especially when, now, first of all, Aaron, let's face it, nobody wants to win the darn NFC South. I don't know what the deal is, but it just, I mean, nobody wants, nobody wants a damn crown. Yeah. But if somebody did want to win it, you know, whether that's the, the Falcons looking over their shoulders at the Bucks or the Bucks looking over, you know, their shoulder at the Falcons, it seemed like the, it seems like those two kind of sort of want to win it. So that makes me feel like, hmm, you could kind of look at, this Falcon Steelers game as a bit of a must win if the Falcons want to at least keep pace with the Bucks to win the division, which is probably at this point their only path to the playoffs. Yeah, and and like you can't even count out the Saints, right? You know? I know. Oh God help us. They got the Bucks this week. They got the Falcons after after the bye week. So it, it's one of those things where like pretty much this whole division is up for grabs. No one <laughs> wants to win it. And if the Falcons lose on Sunday, it's just only adding fuel to that fire but they still won't be out of it because they have some of these division games coming up so yeah Mm -hmm. no one's gonna win this (laughs) i I think it's gonna all boil down to that week 18 game between the falcons and bucks and everybody's just gonna basically just keep tripping over themselves to try to take control of this division but i think you're right if the falcons take care of business the steelers they at least have a little bit more control over their destiny uh you know and then they'll go into the bye week and then have an opportunity you know with a divisional game against the saints. And then you have, Mm -hmm. you know, winnable games against the Ravens and Cardinals. Those teams have not been particularly great. The Ravens started off really strong, but have kind of faded 
as yep. of late. And then, of course, you have that week 18 game. So the Falcons still have a chance here. They just have to sort of, you know, it's similar to the conversation we just had about the Hawks. They have to just start taking care of business. Yes. Yes, indeed. Because, you know, they're going to have their hands full. It, it was almost like identical productivity when you look at what the commanders were able to do against the Falcons. And when you look at what the Steelers were able to do against the Colts, both teams, of course, using uh, running backs by committed, although it was primarily Brian Robinson for the commanders. And before Najee Harris went down, it was Najee. But ultimately speaking, both of those teams were able to get hundred and exactly 172 yards on those respective defenses. So it'll be interesting to kind of see, you know, like you said, as the Steelers offense is kind of finding its way, how that's going to look for the Falcons, especially when you're talking about a quarterback in Kenny Pickett, who's a bit more mobile and a bit more serviceable, I'll say, in, in certain ways versus a Taylor Heineke. Now, the other thing I was thinking about is this. And initially, before we got the news, we talked about, you know, the impact of uh, certain players as far as the decision, uh, how that's going to impact uh, the, the Falcons in terms of their decision to bring them back or, or not bring them back if they're available. Now we know for sure there's no KP. But that's still a legitimate conversation for QB1 because if the Falcons lose to the Steelers and let's say everything kind of goes not in the Falcons' favor, let's say the Bucs actually you know, get a win or what have you, and then the Falcons find themselves darn near mathematically eliminated from the ability to win the division, then do you at this point in the season at this bye talk about, hey, do we need to trot out that other guy for QB1 on the other side of the bye? Yeah, it, it, I gotta I know, ask. I, I, it, it seems like every week we bring this up. It's like, is this going to be the week? Is this going to be the week? You know, and if they don't take care of business against the Steelers, I think we're going to be having the exact same conversation we, we seeming we've been having for like what eight weeks now. Is this going to be the week where it makes sense to play Desmond Ritter, that other guy? Um, and I feel like Arthur Smith is going to continue to deny, deny, deny um at this point in time but yeah this is kind of really the 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 last real chance to really make that quarterback switch given sort of the off week and probably the extra practice week because we know Desmond Ritter hasn't really been getting any reps in in, in during the season because the the backup quarterbacks are, are basically you know out there on the scout team running the opposing team's offense rather than the actual team that they play on's offense so right. he's going to need those extra reps during the bye week if he is going to uh, eventually make a start. So this is kind of it where it's like if, if Arthur Smith is not willing to, to make a change after this Sunday, regardless of the result, then I don't think we're going to see that change at any point this year. Yeah, I would agree. And I think so much is now predicated on that Sunday game. And I think depending on, I would say definitely a loss, but even if we have another decidedly poor performance from one, then the I think the conversation ratchets itself up. And I say ratchets itself up, Aaron, because they cannot convince me that that conversation hasn't been happening at Flowery Branch the same way it has been happening everywhere else in Atlanta Metro. I am sure there's been conversation and commentary about it all along. So uh, good luck making us think otherwise. But Hey, look, we'll we'll see. We'll keep our eyes on it for you guys. And of course, as well, we just kind of look and I'm kind of interested to see because we got a little peek into it. Not that it's going to affect anything necessarily Sunday, but of course, we also found out that Elijah Wilkinson was basically back uh, with the ability to practice. So uh, back in sort of that mix of uh, what's going on with the O-line. And we think that's important because, you know, Elijah Wilkinson was interesting because he, he was kind of up and down. Uh, at the guard position, but certainly had some moments. And um, it'll be interesting to see how, if and how, when he's uh, eligible to be activated back to uh, the 53-man roster, if he's actually going to be put back in a position to start. Yeah, definitely. The Falcons have had musical chairs at that left guard position all year long. I call uh, it left shark, by the way. <laughs> like back at the Super Bowl, just doing yeah. its own thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, is it Wilkinson? Is it Chuma Adoga? Is it Kobe right. Gossett? You know, now Jalen Mayfield's possibly back in the mix. So they have options. I don't know if any of those are good options, but, you know, they'll basically have to sort of figure it out. And, and you know, we got five games left, and we might see five different starters over these next five games, given how the last couple of weeks have gone. Exactly. No one should be shocked any more than we should be shocked 
on any cray cray that comes out of la la land so listen you guys know we bring you the fun and the funk in for the culture so aaron and i are about to talk a little sports entertainment because you know what we like to chuckle about foolishness and what happened out with the lakers was utter foolishness so you know the lakers are up down up down up down and of course uh, they went down i think it was like a buzzer beater last night once again and you know everybody's just kind of sitting there I'm still calling it staples, but whatever. Uh, they kind of just sitting there, you know, in utter shock at what happened. But what was really funny and kind of shocking was the Lakers actually played, you know, we, we've got the hype videos for days. Like the Hawks, that's the number one in-game experience in the entire league has been that way four years in a row, right? And they don't miss. They don't make mistakes, like what I'm about to say. Lakers, however, mistakenly put up players who don't even lace up for the team anymore in their pregame hype video. Aaron, how indicative of 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 uh, of this season and what's going on with this franchise is playing a video that doesn't even have your your real players that are on your roster on that darn video. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like the Lakers have mailed in their season, and it feels like whoever is in charge of the hype videos is mailing it in. They're just going through the motions, just you know, they're just clicking buttons, hitting play. Who who cares? The season's over. You know, it it is what it is. So yeah, yeah that's just I think the perfect summary of what's going on with the Lakers. It just feels like total incompetence on everybody's part. The people on the court, yes. the people off the court, everything. Everything. I mean, it, it's so true because when I think about the in-game experience, and of course, being a part of that last year, I got to see a lot of things that went on behind the scenes. And it's very, very intricate, right? And literally, when you are creating those hype videos, or, you know, sometimes if a player comes back, like Kevin Herter came back this past Sunday for the first time, or I'm sorry, uh, Friday, Wednesday, gosh, it's all kind of coming together in my head. But last week, Kevin Herter came back for the first time with the Kings. And there was this really like nice tribute video to him. You don't just click a button for the tribute video. Like two or three people have to vet that and make sure that's the footage we want to say, whether it's, you know, super, super hype or whether it's a real mellow situation, right? Because somebody like, I don't know, um, Kevin Knox. Okay, they'll acknowledge him when he comes back, the end. But Kevin Herter has to get like a full on tribute video because, hey, folks were not pleased with that trade. So I'm like, Lakers, you guys don't have any quality control? Like, I don't understand. This, this is your hype video. Like, how do you not know who's on the roster? And look, Aaron, we're not talking about a 53 man, okay? You might be able to give the Falcons a pass because, dude, it's 53 guys with helmets on. Maybe you don't know how they all look. NBA roster? I'm talking to all folks here? I mean, you get to see their faces up and, like, up close and personal? Man. La La Land is kind of crazy out there. So I'll give you a little bit of rapid fire here as we wrap up. I'm just going to throw some questions out there for you. And Aaron, you answer them however in the world you feel like it. So the controversy surrounding Clemson is that they, on their social media, did not post the score from their loss to South Carolina this past week. And of course, it was a 31 to 30 loss. And they didn't post it initially. Some people thought, oh, okay, we'll just kind of be nice. And, you know, we'll think positive and we'll think, it's an oversight. Maybe not, because upon further research of Twitter, it appears that South Carolina, the Gamecocks, did not post the score last year when they got shut up by Clemson 31 to nothing. So, my friend, is it gamesmanship or is it just petty? <laughs> I think it's always petty between those two teams, right? right. <laughs> it's always petty between those, you know, the the, the two uh, so-called powerhouses in in the state of South Carolina. So yeah, I'll, I'll go with petty on that one. I'm going petty as well, and I can't wait to see what round three looks like. Right now, speaking of three, you've got three big high school regional playoff games this weekend: Roswell, Gainesville, Langston Hughes, Rome, and Mill Creek and Milton. And the reason I'm bringing those up, Aaron, is because all three of those games had to actually be moved to venues that seat a minimum of 6,000. That is a requirement from the GHSAA. If you are 6A or above, you have to have a minimum of 6,000 seats available. But I just feel like, listen, you play an entire season so that you can get those home games up until the title game that takes you to the Benz or wherever you're going to play your title game, right? I just feel like that's not quite fair to the team that earned the right to have home field advantage. But I do also feel like that's just a GSAAA kind of being greedy because the more seats that you have as a minimum, the more you get paid because it's $15 a pop at this point. Yeah, I, I think that's the right 
take on it. You know, it, it's always about money, right? It's, it's no. capitalism right. at its finest, right? It totally is. It totally is. And then I'll ask you this question. And I know, you know, like you said, your roots are sort of in Pittsburgh. But as we get closer to the weekend and we're starting to really have conversation ratchet up about the SEC title game, I will tell you, being from Louisiana, we say go Tigers as in G-E-A-U-X. And yeah. here in uh, Atlanta Metro or Georgia, you say go dogs as in G-O, but then you say D-A-W-G-S. So I'm just curious to know what you think as far as will it be go Tigers or will it be go dogs come the end of the night on Saturday? Dogs. I always go with the dogs, right? I say the same. And, and, you know, for me, it would be so exciting as well to just kind of see them make history. It's been an amazing run so far, 12 and 0. It'd be great to see those guys just walk through this season undefeated and then have back to back undefeated seasons as well. Something that we've not seen since uh, I believe it's what, 08, 09. Or then you can go back to the Nebraska days. We're taking it back to the Tommy Frazier days. So it'd be kind of cool to see that. And listen, if you want to hear again on a national level about this game, that's going to be one of the bigger championship games this weekend. Check out Locked On Sports today. They talk about it all. They give you their reaction to each and everything. And listen, we're coming back tomorrow, me and one of my guests, because somebody's got to fill in for Jarvis, right? Somebody's got to sit in for the big fella. So we got some great guests who are uh, dialed up for this week. Appreciate you, Aaron Freeman, of course, our guy, our host extraordinaire for Locked On Falcons. If you've not checked it out yet, you should check that out each and every week, especially with the really great reaction that both Aaron and our guy Jarvis have on Falcons games. It's really an awesome look. So again, don't forget to check us out tomorrow because we would love to be talking about a Hawks win. That's kind of what we want to do on this show. If we get any other news out of the Flowery Branch, we're going to bring it to you. And if we get anything else on the sports landscape, we will let you know. Thank you guys for stopping by. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh,